um, what I wanted to share with you, if you have followed um, some of our uh, our emails and our, our um, through our ministry in Portugal, you would notice that we're doing a bunch of different things now than just church and Sunday school and things like that. You saw a store, you saw furniture. Well, with the downturn of the economy, the church that has grown, and you're going to see, if you see in your bulletin, you see chapter three is the title of the sermon. Well, it's kind of an odd, uh, odd title, but Otto will explain it, but we feel we are in the chapter three of our work in Portugal. And the churches are growing. People are, are Christians. They are maturing in their faith. And then a downturn hit, hits the country. Many people lo lost their jobs. Many people, their retirement is cut. Every month, a lady will tell us, I never know how much they're going to cut this month from our retirement. And so through that, God opened up a door and got behind us and pushed us through. And that is with a secondhand store, we now have near one of our churches. And in this community, this secondhand store is reaching into people's lives. People who would never walk 20 feet over and walk into the church door. But they're walking into our store and we are becoming friends with them. For example, we have some Muslims from Guinea that live in the area. A whole bunch of them live in the area around the store. And um, they started coming into our store. And because you can buy a shirt for like a, a euro, which is $1.50 or two fifty, dollars and a coat and things like that, very inexpensive, they've started coming in. And did you know that we're starting to become friends with these people? And one day, one of the fellas, he mentions to our lady who's working up front, I work, you may not have seen me too, in too many of the pictures, that's because I take the pictures, okay? That's why I'm not in them. But I work in the store, I love going to the store, we, we're there two, three times a week, I help organize the clothes in the back, and then we have our Portuguese gal working up front um, with the people. And he comes in and she found out, he shared, um, that he has not gone to one day of school in his life. And at the same time, there was another young lady, a young mother. Her husband is working in France, earning money, and she is living in Portugal with her tiny baby, and he sends money to her. And she looked up very quietly, and she says, I also have never gone to a day of school in my life. Because we come from Guinea, we had to work all our lives. There was no school. So they didn't know how to read or write. And so our, our gal, our uh, Portuguese gal, Rosemary is her name, she says, no problem. What are you guys doing on Wednesday? And we're open Tuesday and Thursday. Wednesday, she has started a class to teach them how to read and write Portuguese. And she has four of these Muslim people coming and they are becoming our friends and they are sharing their lives with us and so these people are not in the church yet but do you know what they're closer by 10 feet than they were before <laughs> and so you can pray you also saw pictures of furniture refur refurnishing we have uh, decided there's so many youth in our churches that have no um no motivation in life. The unemployment for university students is like 35, 40% in our area. And so we have started um, a mentorship, um, refurnishing furniture where they can learn a trade and um, they sell the finished products on the internet and are making some finances. So as you can see, new things are happening in Portugal and God is showing us that there is all kinds of fun ways a person can get out into the community and share their life and the Christian story with others. And we know that this is going to be bring in fruit in the future. It, it's always good to be at this church. Uh, uh, may I? I'll just leave these uh, m music in the back. Is that okay? Or hope I don't get it mixed up with my my stuff. But all of a sudden, we're going to sing uh, sing about the cross here in a little bit. Who knows? 
Um, it's always good to be here. Uh, as Marjorie said, we've been coming here since 1988. Uh, 1988, we hadn't even gone to Portugal yet, and you already commissioned us. You already encouraged us. You already moved us on. And so we just really want to thank this church for its faithfulness. One of the great things about long-term missions is, or for a church like, uh, uh, like this beautiful church, and, and, and Marjorie and I, we've said this very often, that I, we're from California, but... If, if we could, if, if we could get our kids to move up here, we would definitely want to retire right about here. This, to me, it's one of the more, most beautiful areas of the world. And I know you say that it rains a lot, but we love rain. And so uh, anyway, but one of the things that, uh, that a church like this experiences when it has a connection with a missionary over a long period of time is the fact that you can actually track the ministry. Uh, and that's one of the great privileges, I think. Um, parents love to watch their kids. The kids grow up, and for instance, we're loving to watch our kids having kids now. Yeah, so there's four grandkids, and we love to watch that. And one of the things that we can report back to you, if we would talk to some of the people that have been with us uh, since 1988, uh, you would, they would tell you the story little by little. They might even dig up some of the old newsletters that they somehow they discarded but they somehow got left in the corner somewhere in the garage or whatever from 1988 where we were just getting started and there were no believers in in our neighborhood and now if you would ask us uh, there's a number of churches uh, we um, minister to about we figure about 300 to maybe 400 people in in a period of a month and uh, this would not have happened if you would not have encouraged us to go Okay, I just want to really thank you for that. And the f we were talking about, you know, praising the Lord for the Bible, for ministry, for uh, being together as a church and various other things and so on that we were singing about and talking about this morning. Did you know that there's people in our congregations in Portugal that will thank the Lord? I know there are some that are almost every Sunday, they will either in a public prayer or in a private prayer. They will thank the Lord for the churches that sent Otto and Marjorie to Portugal. Not that we're so important. That's not the point. But the churches from here, they realize that now. That the churches from here sent somebody out there to tell them the good news of Jesus. And the interesting thing is that the word Jesus is being used around the world in many different ways. Very often in a very negative way maybe even a cursed term. Uh, so the word Jesus is known in one sense, and very often, you know, these people say, yes, we used to know God, we heard the word Jesus, we heard about him, but we never knew of a loving God. And there's something extremely powerful when we share about a loving, loving, loving God. God loves us immensely. And one of the things that we realize is that we, as, a, as, a con as congregations or maybe in our ministry, uh, Marjorie and I, we are in what we would call chapter 3. That's why it's not chapter 3, uh, Romans chapter 3, but it's Romans chapter 13, but chapter 3 of our life or our ministry. And some of you have been following our ministry throughout the years, and you would say that yeah, that might be true, because it's not chapter 1, it's not the introduction, it's not chapter 1 or 2, but it's right there. But let's read the text, and then we'll, we'll try to bring it together. And if it doesn't totally fit together, those of you that are theologians and uh, biblical scholars, forgive me this time. If you want to have a word or text by, uh, yeah, word by word or verse by verse, uh, come to Portugal, and we will do that, and we'll translate it into English or whatever language you need. Uh, but let's read the text that we have before us this morning. Let no debt remain outstanding. This is interesting. We're talking about money, isn't it? Yeah. Boy, I wish I could have heard you a little bit more. That, that was powerful. Yeah. Very powerful. Uh, is, should I come back next Sunday for that? That's good. Ah, yeah, let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For 
Whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. These are bad things. These are ugly things, aren't they? And whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one command. I love this. This is, this is so good. When everything can be compressed down to one basic concept. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. I have read this text a number of times in my life. And I was just going to say, wow, again. Because that is powerful. When I think, and this is not even part of my script right now, but when I think of Marjorie telling the story of the Muslim man, and he's a leader in his little Muslim community there in Portugal, walking in right there, and he's being loved, I I guess the term nowadays would be loved on (laughs) by people. Nobody is threatening him in any which way. And all of a sudden, even though he never extended his hand before, all of a sudden he extends his hand. And we win so much more by loving each other. I I don't know why the world, well, I, I can understand why the world and the enemy is trying to press us to become more aggressive. But really... We serve a God of love, only God of love, of power. And so I just really have been impressed with how this passage fits so much with what is going on in in our lives in Portugal. And I believe what goes on right here in, in Ferndale. I have been watching Ferndale for, since 1988, or actually before already, but, uh, and, and we love the community, we love the neighborhood, we love to go to woods and, and so on. Even chihuahuas, we think it's good Mexican food and so on. <laughs> we also have seen the church grow over the years. And I just really want to encourage you, good people. Uh, I can't be here every Sunday because God has called us to a different place, physically, geographically. But this is a good church, folks. It is a good church. It's a good place to be. I, I would love to be in this church on a Sunday, well, on a daily basis, on a Sunday to Sunday basis. Just keep on. Don't lose heart. Don't get lost with the numbers games. I'm sorry that I said that, but don't get lost in that. Keep sticking to the word and love your neighbors. Let me get to my passage here a little bit about this chapter 3 business, and we're going to deviate a little bit from the passage at this point. One of the things that we realized about uh, ministry, and especially the kind that we're doing in Portugal, or we have been doing over the last almost 30 years, is that there's an initial phase. For instance, we went to Portugal 27 years ago, and uh, the ministry had just barely gotten started with the Mennonite Brethren Missions and Services at that time. Uh, There was a couple of missionaries there, and there may have been one or two converts and so on uh, when we got there. I remember walking off of the airplane with our little kids, uh, three of them. Uh, Heidi was eight, Jason was five, and Darren was two. And they're all dragging their little backpacks and whatever. And they're all, we're, we're getting to get started. The, the anticipation of that was just incredible. The, the anticipation of what will happen. We had never experienced that kind of thing. We had never, never done that kind of thing. Like gone into a new neighborhood, gone into a new city, gone into a new country, and started something from scratch, from zero. Uh, even... Good news, when it got started, I think it was a hive off of uh, Birch Bay, if I'm not mistaken. 
We had no hives in Portugal because we realized that most of the congregations in Portugal, most of the evangelical congregations are like, you take that group right there, about 20, 30 people. That's a congregation. And if we would take one or two good families out of that group, we realized, rationally thinking, we could destroy other churches by doing that. And if God really called us into Portugal, he would give fruit. It may take a little bit longer, but it's going to, do, it's, it's going to happen. And the crazy, but the funny thing, or the beautiful thing, is that it did. It did. A congregation got started little by little. People actually are, it is amazing when you walk into a cafe, into something like Woods or whatever, how many people are sitting there that will never really say it, but they want to hear more about the love of God. And I learned that. I came from a very large church in California where everything was packaged. Everything was ready to go. I believe you guys even sent a a youth minister down there, Reedley MB, didn't you? Yeah, you guys, yeah, he was there for a number of years. Uh, uh, that's where I grew up, where everything is packaged. Then I love the church even today. I, I, I think it's fantastic. Over a hundred years, that church. There's a tremendous history. And the thing is, here we go to a place where there's nothing. And all of a sudden, we realize that people want to hear about God. They want to. I walk into a cafe at 9 o'clock in the evening. I never realized I could drink so much coffee and still fall asleep at midnight. Or so. And the interesting thing is that it does happen. It does go on. It's the, chapter 1, the initial phase, is kind of like a farmer going out or a, a gardener or somebody. And he's sticking that stick in the ground. And he says, you know, this is a tree. This is a peach tree. This is a pine tree. This is whatever kind of tree it might be. Uh, we were just driving through California recently, and there's this massive, massive plantation of, I believe, what seem to be walnut trees. And all it is is just a stick in the ground. The faith of that farmer is just incredible. That's chapter one. Everybody's looking at that farmer, and he's, it's beautiful. And you know how long it's going to take for him to finally get production off of that stick? Probably five years. No matter how good our technology is, no matter how good we try to uh, science everything and, and chemistry everything and biology everything, we cannot quicken that. We cannot make it faster. It takes that long. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, I, I was thinking of babies. Uh, our daughter-in-law and our daughter, they had babies. And, and, and so we, we think of this. And if the gestation period is less than nine months, we're all concerned. Somehow there's some reality to that. And we could take that also to church. There is a thing, their phase, where it's just a stick in the ground. That's all it is. But those that know about that stick know that that stick will produce. And the same thing that happens in Portugal. It's amazing. Once we were willing to put the sticks in the ground, once we were willing to do that, uh, step by step, all of a sudden we realized that, you know, people are coming to the Lord. Phase one, chapter one, is a beautiful phase. You get dirty, you get sweaty, you get out there, you get out there with the people on a day-to-day basis. You don't worry about too much uh, technology, you don't worry too much about the technical aspects of it, you don't worry too much about the academics of it, you don't worry about too much of that, you just get out there and do it. You, you dig in. I was, uh, uh, we worked on our yard, they had a yard guy come and do a little bit in the backyard uh, here uh, before we came up from California, and he's a friend of mine from back from high school, and he's got a college education and everything, but he's, he's out there, and he's putting the, the, the plants and everything. He's sweating. Well, but maybe you guys aren't, it's not cold enough, I mean warm enough here to sweat yet, but out there in California, what, he's just sweating. He's putting it down, you know, and he's getting dirty, and he's got a college degree. He doesn't worry too much about protocol, as one would say at that point. He doesn't worry too much about wearing a suit or tie. He's out there doing it. That's chapter one. Chapter one is where you get your hands dirty, is where you get right into it. Chapter one is a beautiful phase. Most of us actually like chapter ones. We like to send the missionaries out. We like to plant the trees. We like to start the church. We like to build the building. Chapter one is great. And I could 
tell you many stories about chapter one, but the problem is there's chapter two that comes. And chapter two is the phase where the uh, you guys don't plant peaches here, but people down there in California do, uh, where the peach farmer has planted that peach tree, and he's had, that's been now three or four years, and he's finally getting the first peaches off of the tree. And he takes the peaches off, and he takes a bite, and it's a horrible taste. He goes, oh, man. <laughs> I can't sell this stuff. I thought it was going to be a good variety, and here it's not going to work. Here I have sweated, I have worked, I have irrigated, I have done all these things, all these two, three, four years. And now it looks like I'm going to have to get a bunch of workers out here. It's going to be very costly, and we're going to cut them all off, and we have to graft something different into this because we'll never be able to sell this product. That happens. Many of my friends there in, in the Reedley, Dinuba, Fresno, Visalia area, they'll have to do that very often. And they have to go in the third or fourth year, and they have cut everything off because it just won't. That's chapter two. It just won't work. You know that great idea we had for church planting? Well, it just isn't working. Hmm. We'll have to change our mind on that one. Uh, there, there, there's so many things about chapter two that makes it difficult. Chapter two is where you have been working with this individual in church. Maybe I shouldn't use, uh, it doesn't happen here because it might be very personal, but it, it doesn't happen here. It happens in other churches. Where you've been working with this, this individual and you say, wow, this is going to be a great leader down the road. And I am really going to invest my time in this individual. And I bet you your pastor has been doing that kind of stuff. Your pastors over the years have been doing that kind of stuff. Investing time in people. All of a sudden, about a year or so later in your conversations, you're at Woods one day. I love Woods. Uh, you're at Woods one day, and, and, and you're sitting there and having coffee with this individual that you think in your mind as a leader, you think this is going to be a great leader down the road. And all of a sudden, this baggage comes out that you'd never heard about. And you realize that you know, this, these great plans you had for next year or just around the corner, we're going to have to put that off just a little bit. And we're going to have to go back a couple of steps and work some other things through. That's chapter two. Chapter three, two is when things aren't working out the way you would like to. Yes, some things are, but others aren't. The same thing with, uh, with, with uh, even, even missionaries, even workers themselves, very often come to the point where they say, is this really the place where I should be? Is this really my place? And when you're in a place like Portugal, Lisbon, where, as my friend says, my Portuguese friend says, it grinds you into the ground, you say, is this really my place? People are coming to the Lord, but it's not every year. It's not every, every second year. And so you're questioning yourself, is this really where God is calling me? Do I, do I continue? And we have seen many, Marjorie and I very often say if we'd ever write a doctorate, we'd write it on the area of burnout, where missionaries burn out and just simply realize that maybe this wasn't for them or they question God so much that they're leaving. Or mission organizations or churches or whatever. I just heard recently a good friend of mine, a pastor from a very large church in California, came back from one of our mission fields. And I'd say probably the toughest mission field in the world right now, uh, Paris, France. And uh, he says, you know, what I just saw is it concerns me. And I said, wow, it's only three years that they've been there or four years, whatever. There's so much in the beginning stages still. But we're so used to seeing the big numbers here in North America and so on. And so stage, th uh, stage two, very often, even the leadership starts questioning all kinds of things. But, you know, after you get through that stage of life, there is chapter three. Chapter 3 is one of those happy moments again. It's where in the book the plot develops. And all of a sudden the characters go in all kinds of directions. And there's all kinds of happy things and maybe even difficult things and so on. But things that, issues that develop and they resolve themselves and so on within the plot. And the same thing in the churches that we've noticed as, we de as churches are growing. Chapter 3 is where... Uh, the students that we sent off to Bible college when they were just 18, 19, they've come back. They're 22, 23, 24, whatever. And all of a sudden, they're into leadership already. You're catching yourself. Wow, these guys are good. They're, they're, they're good at not just uh, music, but they're also good at preaching, at teaching, at, at leading. This is fantastic. 
And all of a sudden, uh, like a couple of years ago, Marjorie and I were sitting, we're being asked, so uh, Otto and Marjorie, uh, a team came through a couple of years ago, says, so which, t- which church are you pastoring? And we're looking at ourselves, you're right, we're not pastoring any single of our six churches anymore. Every one of them is being pastored by somebody else. Every one of them is being led by somebody else. Everyone has their own little uh, leadership team, whether they call it elder group or or council or whatever. It doesn't really matter the term, but they're being led, and they've invited us to be be, uh, participate in it and help them in their leadership and so on. And that's chapter 3. Chapter 3 is one of those moments where just a few weeks ago we were at North Fresno Church and uh, we had one of our national workers with us and Pastor James Bergen uh, asked him to co-preach the sermon with, with James. I go, wow, he didn't ask me, he asked my national, uh, our national leader. So there's Joe uh, co-preaching with the, this American pastor. And they're on stage, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the sermon somewhere, uh, Pastor James asks uh, Joe from Portugal to introduce his team. Well, there was us, me and Marjorie, and somebody else yet out there. And so we're being introduced by a Portuguese national to to the Americans. That's chapter three, okay? And we would like to see that happen where... We will bring a national here with us, and we will let them preach and teach and sing and so on. And then they will introduce us. Oh, yeah, there's Otto and Marge sitting in the back right there. Yeah. That's chapter 3. Chapter 3 is a fantastic moment in life. Chapter 3 is where you see that things are moving on. And we would like to report to you as a supporting church all these years. And when when I say supporting, I think of the finances, too. You were willing to and are willing to invest in us and the ministry in Portugal financially, and not just Portugal, but many other places. And we just really want to thank you for that. So there's just this enormous moment uh, where we realize that all of a sudden the ministry is growing. There's all kinds of things that are moving way beyond ourselves. The farmer all of a sudden realized it's not just a one-man operation, one man on a tractor, but because he needs somebody to prune, to thin, to, do, to, to clean the field, to package the fruit, to uh, store the fruit, to sell the fruit. He realized that is way beyond him or her. It's not way beyond one person. Chapter 3 that's where we're in. We realize, uh, you saw some pictures right here of teams, and I wish we could introduce every one of our team members to you, but we're the only North Americans on that team by now. All the rest are either nationals or from Europe. Isn't that fantastic? I think that is just incredibly fantastic. Now, would we like to see North Americans come and help us? We would love to see one or two couples from this church and, uh, come and help us because we could start another church or maybe a, second, a third church right now if, if, if we would have the help from, uh, from people right here. So how does this all tie in with the passage that we just read? How does this tie in with this love your neighbor? One of the things you need to realize is that we have a fellow in our church. His name is Senor Gomish. Senor Gomish is one of those guys that when you walk with him through the city, through the downtown area, you might as well forget about having a conversation with him because either that person will stop him or he will stop somebody. And he came to the Lord through the ministry of our team many years ago, about 20 years ago. And it's been amazing that in all these years, he continues to touch people's hearts and lives. And he always has a little word of encouragement for people. He doesn't throw the Bible at them. I know some of us would like to, because it's the word of God, and we'd like to give it to them all. But he has a way of giving them just a little chunk of the word of God, just a little piece of that. And part of that is this thing of loving your neighbor as yourself. And through him, so many people have come to church, have come to taste the goodness of the Lord. And I would just really like to encourage us as we keep moving on, as we keep working on different areas, that we would allow this love of God, the love of God for our neighbor, for us, for everybody around us, has to permeate, has to permeate us whether we are in chapter 1 of our life, chapter 2, or chapter 3. Whether you're starting out, whether you're questioning or, or 
uh, analyzing a lot of things and doubting maybe even some things, or whether you're in chapter 3 and moving on. One of the things I'd like to encourage us all with, sometimes we wonder about these kind of things, where we are as a, as a, as a Christian religion. And the way I see it is the Christian religion is, I believe, the only religion of true love. Jehovah God is the God love. He says God is love. We don't teach about God's love. We don't, uh, tell, you know, we, don't, we don't exercise God's love. Yes, we do, all of that. But more than that, God is love. God so loved the world that he gave us his son. Love, love, love. If you and I, I know this is the big challenge because we're going totally countercultural, totally counterpolitical, totally counter many, many things here, but that's what Christianity is all about. If we were to be willing to love our neighbor, I know the Bible even says to love our enemies. I'm not going to go that far today. I'll let the pastor do that one. Do you, get, do you get what I'm trying to say here? I don't think, I'm going to try to extend myself here a little bit before you. I don't think that we're going to bomb anybody into the kingdom, but we're going to love people into the kingdom. I think we missed the point, and the world sucks us into that and makes us believe that that's the best way to go. And I think we miss, we miss the reality of what God really has for us. And sometimes we question ourselves whether we're really experiencing the greatness and the love of God. I think it's because we get sucked in by these kind of philosophies and theories that make us do things and act in certain ways. And it's totally counter that what God has for us. Did you see that in the beginning when we read the passage that this loving your neighbor as yourself... it. It takes care of all the big sins, all the sins of this world. Wouldn't you like that? I would really like to encourage us to give that some thought. Now, maybe you think, okay, maybe this guy that just comes through every three years and he, he pushed our button a little bit too far and maybe he didn't, doesn't know exactly what he's talking about. That's okay with me. Did you know that one of the greatest... Uh, leaders of our churches in Brazil many years ago. He sat and went home. He heard a missionary sermon, and he went home, and he was milking cows, and he criticized the sermon. Then the next day, he criticized the sermon. The next day, he criticized the sermon. The next day, he criticized. For a week or more, he criticized the sermon until he realized that God was speaking to him. And so it's my prayer that God will continue to speak to your heart, but also to my heart. 